Happy summer reading. Happy summer reading season, everyone. And we'll call this meeting to order of the Circulation Technical Group on 935 on July 12th. Um, first up is the approval of minutes. Did everybody have a chance to review? Are there any questions, changes? Do we need a motion, Mieko, to? If there are no changes, we can just uh, accept as submitted. Okay. Okay, accepted as submitted. Does anyone have um, any additions to the agenda? Um, I do. I was hoping, I'm still trying to get feedback on this whole door-to-door -door library card sign-up issue. So I was hoping if somebody has feedback on that, maybe we could talk about it a little bit. Sure. Anyone else? And I and I will say you did bring this up um, before you didn't have air conditioning. So it wasn't just an excuse to visit people with air conditioning, right? Yeah. No, it wasn't that. <laughs> yeah. Though now that you mention it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Belinda? Yes. Could we add um, what possibly libraries are doing for library card sign up month. You bet. Thanks. All right, got you down there, Kim. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you. Um, on to officer reports. Uh, the chair is not here. As the vice chair, I don't really have anything to say except yay, it's summer reading time. Um, and we see lots of shiny, smiley faces. Um, Janine? No updates for me, sorry. No, that's good. All right, Mieko, it's all you. Cool. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to post a link to our meeting sign-in sheet to the chat. I will, um, as always, email that out to the group after the meeting. Um, if you attended Please just pop your name in by your library. Um, and then for my other updates, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, and now hopefully my slides are displayed. Cool. Um, so just a few updates, um, just some general updates. Uh, so one is kind of like a housekeeping thing. Um, just like last year, we will be alternating between virtual and in-person meetings. Um, so our October and April meetings uh, will be in person at the CCS office. Um, so if you've been, to, if you were at last year's in-person meetings, uh, you know that we've got two potential meeting spaces that we can use. We have um, a room called the fishbowl room, and then we have the auditorium. Um, so we're in the auditorium in October. That's the larger room with a theater style seating. Uh, if you were at the April meeting, uh, that's in the fishbowl room, and that's the, the smaller room with the classroom style seating. Um, so we're going to plan to be in the fishbowl for in-person meetings. Um, however, the fishbowl can only hold up to 40 people. Uh, and in our group, um, like in-person attendance can get pretty close to 40. So like uh, <clears throat> we may need to adjust space and size up to the auditorium. Um, now, if we need to adjust space, uh, like if we need to, you know, cancel and rebook, we are required to give our building 10 business days notice. So this means we need to know how many people are going to attend um, ahead of that deadline. So for our in-person meetings, they are now going to require an RSVP by a deadline. Um, so you will see the RSVP deadline in like all the listserv emails. Um, it will be posted directly uh, on the RSVP form and on the CCS and L2 calendars. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, when we get to our in-person meetings. Um, the next thing I want to mention uh, is the uh, 7.6 upgrade. Um, so we upgraded our training database to the newest version of Polaris, which is version 7.6 uh, back in May. Um, and we've been testing new features and performing our standard like 
all the assurance testing since then. Um, we are finalizing our upgrade date with Innovative. Uh, we anticipate an early August upgrade date. Um, there is no big features that are going to apply to circulation in 7.6, um, but there is a bug that's present in 7.6 that impacts if you update a non-local CCS patron. Um, thankfully, this does not apply to like non-CCS reciprocal borrower updates or if you're just like updating someone's password. Um, I'm going to show you what this looks like uh, in a moment. Um, I do want to mention that there is a fix that has already been built into the next software version. We are asking for a patch for 7.6, but unsure if or when one will be ready. Um, okay, so let me, I'm just going to show you what this looks like first. Um, so I'm logged in to Leap as Glencoe. And I have a Lincolnwood patron um, up here. So if I go into the registration work form, what this bug is impacting is if I'm updating these areas in like the, the work form. Since this is a non-local patron, there's a lot of data that I'm just like not allowed to update based on our circulation rules. Um, so I like, right, I'm not allowed to change things like their patron code or their stat class or their birth date. But I am allowed to change someone's like email address, phone number, or notice preference. Um, so what happens um, if I attempt to uh, update a non-local patron? So let's say letters at uh, my email.com um, and I click save. Uh, what I'm going to see is this patron code ID is invalid message. Um, and that is because it's only allowing me to update patron codes like that are assigned to my location for. So for Glencoe, it'd be like GCK patron, GCK educational, that sort of thing. Again, I'm able to up, like reset the user's password. That's totally fine. Um, this does not impact non-CCS reciprocal borrowers. Um, just if you have someone from another CCS library and you want to update their email or uh, phone number or notice preference. Um, so hopefully you don't encounter those situations too often. Um, let me get back to you. Mika? Uh, yes. If a patron changes libraries, is, is it all, as long as we change the registered at, then that's okay. You are correct. If okay. you're re-registering, as soon as you update to your library, you will not run into those issues. Um, so, <laughs> there we go. Um, so again, uh, if you're updating the phone number, email notification preference, um, and language, I forgot to mention language, um, you will run into that invalid message. So there's a couple of things you can do until a fix is available. You can either um, help the patron make those updates through the power pack, um, or you can just refer them back to their home library. So uh, do let me know um, if you have any questions about that. Um, I will try to send out a reminder to the group um, closer to our upgrade date, just as a reminder. Um, I will also say we have a page on our website um, for like upgrades and reported issues. Um, and the reported issues just has a list of like current bugs impacting library staff um, and like the status of the bug. So we will update that too as uh, more information becomes available. Um, moving on, I have a last minute addition to my update, um, and this comes from message B. Um, so to meet updated carrier compliance standards, message B will begin issuing a welcome text to new text notification patrons. Uh, and this will begin August 1st. Um, so some background here, phone carriers just have some improved standards about giving users opt-out guidance. 
So the welcome message gives the user an initial opportunity to say like, no, thank you. Um, so I have a screenshot here of how the sample message will read. So it basically just says like, gives them the instruction to stop to opt out of messages. Um, you will see it also says start. However, um, the start directive does not apply to us. The patron does not have to respond start to receive text. Message B assumes that the patron has opted in to the messages through signing up for their library card uh, and noting they want text messages or selecting, making that selection in their account in the power pack. So the patron does not have to respond to start. Another um, thing to note, oh yes. But they will see that that is like standard message. So it's gonna say that, okay. It will. Um, only newly enrolled patrons will receive the welcome text. It's not going to be issued retroactively to existing patrons. Uh, so if a patron is currently receiving text messages, they will not receive this welcome message. It's only when you register a new patron or you update a user's notice preference to be text, right? So those are considered like the new users, they'll get the welcome message. Um, and then finally, um, if a patron ever does respond stop, uh, which they can do now, um, libraries can see patrons who opted out using the communication preferences screen in message Bean. Um, so we'll have a short blurb about this in uh, CCS News, um, just sharing this information as well. So I'm pause and see if there's any questions about that. I have a question, Nico. If they press stop, does it automatically, so we would have to go and update their notice preferences after checking message B? I believe so. So I believe that if a user says stop, message B will dis like, uh, display the information for those patrons in that um, communication preferences screen in message B, and then staff We'll need to go into like leap and make that change to email or phone. Miyako, can you go back to the screen where you showed um what the message said? Mm -hmm. Oh, type start to present. Thank you. Does anything weird happen if they do press start or they type in start and send them? It doesn't up? sound like it. Okay. Yeah. So moving on to arguably the most exciting update, um, our migration update. Uh, so our new libraries, uh, Mount Prospect and Waukegan, they are beginning to work on data testing. Staff recently started Polaris training um, and we are working our way through all the little configuration details. I'm just gonna... Um, so uh, we're, you know, Getting ready for that go live. Um, yesterday, it published a migration page on our website. Um, so the direct URL, did I add that to, I did not add that to the slides, I apologize. Um, when I have a break, I will pull up that URL and post it in chat for everyone. Um, you can find the page under the member tools menu on our website. Um, so right now, uh, pretty much all we have on that website, on that web page, is the go live schedule um, and links to the offline resources. Um, so we are going to be adding so much more information as our details are worked out. Um, we will be promoting the page regularly and sharing important details and preparation tasks directly in CCS News. Um, so over the next couple months, it is very important to keep up with the newsletter. 
So make sure you get it today and read through it. Um, if you need to be subscribed, open a help desk ticket and we can get you on that list. So I, uh, what I wanted to do today uh, was just kind of take us through the offline schedule. Um, so we recently finalized our offline schedule with Innovative. Um, if this is your first, oh, thanks, Kiara. Um, so the link to the migration page is in chat. If this is your first migration, um, there is a period of offline before any kind of go live. During this time, Innovative is loading and processing the data, um, re-indexing and deduplicating BIP records. So Mount Prospect and Waukegan will need to come offline before the remaining CCS libraries. So they will start using offline on September 26th and 27th respectively. And then all CCS libraries will be offline from September 28th through the 30th. Um, so during the offline period, uh, we will be able to check out to patrons. Libraries can optionally register new patrons. We will not be able to check in, place new holds, renew cards, pay fines, perform any kind of cataloging or acquisitions work. We anticipate having um, like our previous migrations, having view only access to training leap for staff and SIP redirected to the training environment, um, to the training um, uh, power pack um, to allow the patrons to like search the pack uh, and allow SIP connected services like OverDrive to authenticate off of the training database. Um, so we uh, need to confirm those details with Innovative. When they are formally confirmed, we will publish the details of the migration webpage. So everyone will be offline from the 28th through the 30th. And then libraries will plan on being online again, start of day, October 1st. So again, we're gonna have so many more details to work out. Um, like due dates around offline, auto renew around offline, um, post go live patron merges. So as those details are worked out and finalized, we'll publish them to the migration webpage once confirmed. Um, and again, um, important things like how to prepares are going to be um, also included in CCS news. I know everyone here has gone through this so many times at this point. Um, so it's hopefully feels like a, a pretty good review at this point. Um, so Belinda, those were my updates. Oh, okay. So we can go on to old business. Let me pop in no. chat. <laughs> oh. migration is a good time it's a good time <laughs> um well we have each other for support so that's really helpful and uh, and the the whiz um the whiz kids at ccs to walk us through it um so we'll go on to um new business then and there it is polaris offline review <laughs> um i did want to go through an offline review today for a few reasons um most importantly, this is our last meeting before the migration offline period. Um, the other reason was we we had that period of increased service disruptions. Uh, thankfully, you probably saw in last week's CCS news, Innovative applied a patch to our database uh, that we anticipate will resolve those issues. Um, but I think it's you know it's always a good idea uh, for us to review offline periodically in case we do need to use it during a service disruption. So um, just kind of start off with a big overview about offline. Polaris offers two different offline modes. Um, so just def quickly defining those modes. The first mode is remote offline. Um, just for background, our database servers are hosted offsite. Um, so that means when anyone uses the Polaris staff client, they are connecting to those servers remotely. 
Uh, so when we use remote offline, that means we are connected to our remote servers, but we're working in an offline mode. Our servers are available, but our actual database is not. Um, so the big example of when we use remote offline is uh, library migration. Uh, we can connect to our servers, but we can't use our database. Um, or you may have used remote offline during those recent periods of system issues. Again, a situation where we can connect to our servers, but we can't use the database. The second mode is local offline. And local offline means we are not able to connect to our servers. So instead of any activity happening on our remote servers, it's all happening locally on your computer and not online. So the big example for local offline is uh, if a library does not have internet connection. So these bullet points outline the difference between remote and local offline. With remote offline, you're using the Polaris staff client. Again, because you're able to connect to the remote servers, you can use the regular client. You're just logging in in offline mode. Whereas with local offline, you're using a separate application that's been installed directly on your computer. When using remote offline, all files are stored on the remote server. And the great thing about this is because they are stored in a remote location, CCS staff are able to access and upload the transaction files for you. When you're using local offline, Everything is done locally on your computer. So that means the transaction files are stored on your computer. Um, this unfortunately means that CCS is not able to access the files. Uh, and so you are required to upload the transaction files yourself. Um, for the migration, we will be using remote offline. Uh, Steph will check out and, and optionally register patrons in offline mode. CCS will upload the transaction files uh, when our database is available. So I am going to exit from my slides so we can do a little demo um, in offline. So when I'm using remote offline, um, again, I'm connecting to those remote servers and I'm gonna use their staff client. I'm just using it in offline mode. Uh, so I'm going to open just the regular production client. Um, <laughs> connect. Um, when you connect, the, the first step it's going to do is connect to that remote server. Your computer may be set up so that it automatically does this step. Um, mine is not, so it prompts me to connect to the remote servers by entering in some credentials. So I'm gonna say okay there to finish connecting. <laughs> and then when I am connected. And it's gonna tell me I'm connected. So now I am in the client login screen. So for this one, when we are remote, we want to select this little checkbox to say work offline. And that automat that puts me in offline mode. Uh, so you'll see here, I still need to enter in my username. I do not need to enter in my password. And then when I click OK, this is going to start my offline session. This is my home internet being kind of slow today. There we go. Um, so you'll see there's many options that are unavailable in offline mode. Um, the only ones we use are checkout, which is under circulation, or if you're registering users, you'll use uh, patron records under patron services. We do not use check-in when in offline mode because there is no way for the system to determine if an item needs to go in transit, if it needs to be on hold, or if it just otherwise requires some kind of action. 
Um, for today's demo, we're just going to look at checkout. Um, so I've got a user coming to my desk who's ready to check out. I will open up the circulation menu and select the checkout option. So the first thing, I just need to move my uh, little Zoom thing here. There we go. Um, when you begin checking out, uh, the very first time you're doing a checkout for a session, um, check your receipt settings. Uh, your receipt settings are found under tools and options. And here you just wanna make sure that the option to print a checkout receipt is selected. And you want to make sure that the correct printer um, is uh, that it's printing from the correct printer. I'm going to click OK to go back. Um, so when you're checking out to a patron, you'll scan their card and I'm just type in my test user. Um, I'll say make sure just double check that the barcode is entered correctly. Um, Polaris offline is not able to identify invalid barcodes. Um, once the barcode is typed in or scanned in, um, and you have it here, if the patron exists in the database, you will see their name and they're registered at location. Um, offline will display a pop-up for certain block conditions. So if the patron has something like a library assigned block, um, the message will pop up here. You can either continue to like, choose to continue the transaction or stop the transaction. Um, the resources we have online that I will um, highlight here when I'm done with the demo, will tell you exactly what the block conditions are. When you're ready to check out item, just make sure your cursor is in the little item barcode field. And I'm going to copy and paste some barcodes. Um, when you're checking out, um, the default due date is applied. Um, libraries can determine their own default date. Most libraries, I believe all libraries, are either set to two weeks or three weeks. Um, if you want to verify what your default um, offline loan period is, um, just open a help desk ticket and we can either check those settings and update those settings uh, if you need. check out one more item here as our default with our default date. Um, as you're checking out, if you do need to apply a different loan period, you can adjust the loan period using this special button. So I'm just going to click that to open. Um, and with this, you can either use the calendar to select a specific date or you can use this loan period um, value um, to enter in a, uh, a specific period, seven days, 14 days, 28 days, however. And then you have the option to apply just to the next item you scan, apply to all remaining checkouts to this patron, or apply to all checkouts for your session, meaning until you log out of offline. Um, for this one, I'm just going to select to apply to all items for this patron and say OK. Uh, so now I can see my um, special loan period uh, displayed here. So this tells me that it's something, um, a value other than my standard value. And when I scan my next item, it's going to apply that special loan period date because I opted to apply to all remaining checkouts for this patron, um, that value is still active. Do one more. Um, now, if I want to remove that special loan period, you can click reset to wipe it out to reset it. Uh, and it will go back to your default loan period. Okay. 
Um, once all items have been checked out to this patron, you'll place your cursor in the item barcode field and um, simply click enter on your keyboard to close this user out and then it will print their checkout receipt. As you're checking out, um, patron, the item, due date information, it's stored in a transaction file. Um, after a couple hours, those transaction files can become pretty big. The best practice is to log off and log back on every two to three hours. Um, so I think for most libraries, um, hopefully this matches up with like desk shift changes. Um, and the reason for this is that when you log off and you log back on, that ends a transaction file and creates a new file. Um, and this helps protect us um, just in case if a file is somehow corrupted, having those multiple smaller files throughout the day um, just helps protect against losing all of your transactions. So when you're ready for that, that you know, desk shift change um, and you wanna, um, or if you just wanna create a new small file, all staff need to do um, is in the client, open up file, log off, confirm. So it's gonna end my last session and then I'll go file, log on, and I'll once again, click that work offline, enter in my username. Um, and now a new transaction file has been started. Um, and then because this is remote offline, um, staff don't need to worry about uploading the transaction files when we are back online. Um, so with remote offline, all of those files are stored on the remote server. So CCS staff can access and upload them for libraries. So let me go back to my slides here. Um, so the resources, I mentioned we had some resources um, that were available online. The first uh, one, the first bullet point here is a step-by-step -step how to page on our website for using remote offline. Um, we also have how-to pages available for using local offline and uploading those local offline files. Um, I did not include them on the slide, but they are um, available on our website as well. Um, the second is a dedicated offline course, or I'm sorry, dedicated online course for using offline, um, remote offline specifically. Um, this course was developed for during the Palatine Grays Lake migration. Um, so there are like mentions of that project. Um, however, the course includes videos and software simulations uh, in case staff um, prefer to um, learn that way or get some guided practice. Uh, and then finally, uh, what I want to plug today, we will be holding an go live review and an offline demo webinar on September 12th. So if you were around last year, uh, you may have attended the Warren Newport Go Live prep webinar. This will be the same thing. We'll review offline um, and the Go Live events and timeline, uh, and then we'll do a remote offline demo that includes both checking out and registering cards. Um, so again, we'll be sharing things, uh, sharing details um, about things like close dates, auto renew, SIP API info, preparing self checks, um, and more as those details are finalized. Um, so please watch for listserv updates, CCS news updates, the migration page, register for that webinar, um, and we will all be ready for um, the migration. Uh, so we've got a question about uh, self checks how to. Um, we don't have how to on our website for self checks um, since everyone kind of uses the different self checks. Um, so I would uh, check in with your vendor to see what information they have about using self checks in offline mode. Um, the September 12th webinar, I believe that is a one hour webinar. It's be like 1.30 to 2.30 if I'm remembering correctly. It will be recorded uh, as well. So if you're not able to attend live, you will absolutely have access to the recording. Diego, can I ask a question about um, 
creating library cards. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Um, I remember that we're supposed to only use one machine to do that. Correct. Can you just explain why? Because people ask and then I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to explain. Um, so we do require, as Michelle mentioned, we work, if you are registering users and offline, we require you to have one dedicated workstation to do that registration on. And what happens there is that we will upload those registration files first before we do any checkout transaction files. If a transaction file is uploaded before a registration file and the patron like doesn't exist in the database yet, it will error out. So that's why we need to make sure we upload those registrations first. Now, my follow-up question is that same computer that we're creating the cards, can we also do the transactions for checking out? Or is it only, should be only patron signups on that computer? I think it, historic, I'm trying to remember what we've done historically. Deborah, if you remember, can you chime in? I want to say that they've only been registration, but I may be remembering that correctly, incorrectly. Yeah, we have historically said only registrations on that computer, but, oh, sorry, I was muted. My bad. Um, I think historically we've said only registrations on that computer, but Miego, let's revisit that because I think it should be okay if they do checkout transactions too. So let's maybe do some testing with that and we'll update the group. Yeah. Thank you. I'll keep thinking of your questions. Um, you'll be hearing so much more migration stuff over the next couple months. I know Janine is living in it every single day. <laughs> Some of us um, have to dust it off because it's been a while. Yeah. I will turn it back to you, Belinda. Um, okay, um, next up on new business is our friend Karen to talk about Find More Illinois. Well, I'm not going to talk about it. I want you oh, guys come to on. talk about it. <laughs> well, what's well, your just, questions? Yeah. Well, my question, I mean, I don't know if anybody in the group here has has went on to Find More yet. And if they can give me any kind of um, information, um, if there's any, like, you know, any information about it. <laughs> Is anybody here already like in doing find more? Well, we started here at Wilmette. Uh, we started find more uh, July 2nd. Um, so we've been doing it for about 10 days now. And I, I think we're somewhere around like 20 something uh, items that we've processed. Um, all I can say it's 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 been real intuitive. Um, you know, there's always some stress learning something new, but uh, we've been able to, uh, you know, manage it. Um, we The only thing we picked up uh, a little bit of a discrepancy on some of the dates. Um, for example, I, I know that, um, and we had talked to Kiera about this, the, the lender full, uh, full record display, the lender, um, Full request and the NCIP dates weren't matching, but we determined that I think it was Sherrit was rounding off the due dates. Um, it was a little involved, but that was the only little issue, little glitch that I saw. Um, generally, uh, Find More, you know, has been going very well, at least on on our end. Um, and yeah, no, the, the ILL yeah. department seems to be excited about it. Uh -huh. Have you guys had any, um, have you, you know, your patrons done, have you just mainly been sending to the other Find More libraries or have your patrons been requesting? It, well, we've done kind of like a soft uh, launch. So we haven't really been doing a lot of advertising it. I, I think patrons, the, the requests, we're, we're, we're doing both. 
but I think the mm -hmm. requests are going to go up as, as we uh, do more advertising. I right say, now, yeah. it's obviously just in the catalog. Uh, mm -hmm. Our PR person is supposed to do a little bit more on the website. But uh, yeah, no, we decided to just go you know, lending and borrowing. Just do it all. Okay. From the start. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're doing it. Our we're going live at the end of the month, is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to. And um, is it so? It just um comes on your pick list. You guys pick it, and like right away when you check it in, you can tell it's a fine more. Exactly. When we see that it's fine more, obviously you don't know until you clear it. It's then uh, we send it to the ILL department. So we keep okay. those those separate. Okay. So it's, it's pretty easy, at least for the staff who aren't working in ILL, the process right. of doing the pick list and then trapping it and seeing it's uh, a find more item and redirecting yeah. that elsewhere. That, that That's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Okay, great, great. That's mainly what I wanted was like, you know, the staff that are doing the pick list and doing that, you know, and obviously, yes, when I was just wondering like how it showed up when, so they know immediately that it's find yes. more and then we'll just give it to our ILL person. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> uh, Zion's been doing it for a while. Um, I don't really have anything more to add. It's It's been pretty easy, um, actually. Um, it's very seamless, too, um, in order to check out and, and send something to another library. It's just a matter of scanning it. Um, to receiving something the same way it, you scan it all the information's there um who requested yeah. it and everything and so um there's just less to do than um in comparison to OCLC um i i like it i think it's it's good uh i don't do it all the time because bob does um, but I have not heard of any complications that he's ran into yet. Um, I I think we should have been doing it all along. So why haven't we? Uh, <laughs> um, but the training the training was very helpful. And then once uh, you get hands on, uh, it really it makes it, more it's sense. Not, it's not complicated. It's it's just uh, because it's something new um, and we all have a little anxiety. Uh, but no, I see Tori is asking mostly sending. No, we we uh, request items too uh, for our patrons. Um, so we send and receive and, and okay. they're both equally easy. Um, and there's so many uh, ways to search for items, too. Um, so if you, you know, you can do the ISBN, the OCLC number like you do um, in OCLC. Um, but it's uh, it lets you know if uh, if a CCS library has it for you requests from somewhere else. Um, so it, it's got good things. Uh, measures to uh to keep us on the rules great thank you but once you do it it's it's pretty easy okay. you know print this and send it and that's you know turn the paper over send it back mm -hmm. right well we're looking forward to it you know just yeah thanks for the input <laughs> yeah don't be nervous um it'll be fine that's my advice. <laughs> oh, I'm going to let my ILL person know that. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them I said relax. It'll be fine. <laughs> that was Thank awesome. Yep. Great question. I hope that helps um, ease some other people's future um, changes to change is hard, but um, it's nice to know that it's been pretty seamless. I was just double checking. Um, in June, we sent 31 items out, which is about kind of a quarter of our normal ILL. So, I mean, I guess it's going pretty well. Um, so that's that's good news. Um, Viego, it's your turn again. Yay. Um, before <laughs> we jump back into my stuff, Anastasia posted some stats um, about Park Ridge. Uh, so Park Ridge went live June 11th. 
They lent 13 items and borrowed 15 during the first two weeks. Um, it's been pretty seamless. It's really interesting seeing uh, the stats during, like, just after launch. Um, Tori, yes, Tori, with migration coming, how is Find More Illinois involved? Um, so are you talking about, like, Find More during the offline period? Yes, those are some details that we are still working out. Um, so you will get more information when available. And I can just <laughs> give a quick update on that. Oh, yeah. While we're offline, libraries won't be able to process materials, um, either to receive them or to send them out. So it'll be kind of like a four day pause on find more things. But fortunately, two of those days are over the weekend anyway. So you'd really just be stopping for like the Friday, Monday. Okay. Ask a quick question. Sorry, Nick. Yeah. No, um, let's go for it. You may have touched on this in past meetings, but how come the migration isn't during Labor Day weekend? So. Um, this is dependent on the new library schedule and innovative schedule too. Um, so we've been lucky the past couple times where, uh, like a holiday weekend has fit in, um, but we, we didn't have that opportunity this time around. Just cur for my own curiosity, um, does the group enjoy having it over the holiday weekend? I see a head nod from Belinda. It is kind of nice because usually we're closed one or two days. So that's one or two days we don't have to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> and and honestly, I'll say it's the time of the year or two because a lot of people are on vacation, whereas a month later, people kids are back in school. So it's a little busier, but, um, you know, I mean, we'll manage our patrons are super flexible. So, yeah. It, um, I know one, one big factor is Innovative's project schedule. Um, their implementations team has been really, really busy these past couple of years. Um, we were incredibly lucky to get the Labor Day weekend last year during Warren Newport. Um, so we do have to fit in with like what windows they have open for us. I also think um, the first seems like it's always a day that things get bogged down with reports and things that are required for our board meetings. Um, Cause it seems like we might have a delay in all of the reporting for that time. And we have ILA and back in circulation at the same kind of time. So a lot of staff are so running thin those weeks for conferences, just something to think if we know conferences in advance. But I agree, I like the Labor Day if we can, or whatever holiday it is. Well, thanks for the feedback. Are there any other questions before we move on to free text blocks? Okay, uh, so we had a, if you're at the April meeting, um, we had a presentation at the April meeting about library blocks, um, and that included both library assigned and free text blocks. Um, after the meeting, I received some questions about free text blocks, so I wanted to explore them just a little more detail at today's meeting. So when we're talking about free text blocks, um, these are slightly different than library assigned blocks. Uh, with library assigned blocks, you select a predefined value from the list, um, but the free text block allows you to type a custom block message. And that block, that text then becomes your block. Um, so when the patron goes to check out, staff see their usual block pop up with the free text message. This message will always pop up at checkout in Leap. So to continue the transaction, staff will either need to like back out, remove the block before checking out, 
or staff need override permissions to continue with the transaction. So that's the leap behavior. Um, and it's just some bullet points summarizing what I just mentioned. Now we're talking, when we talk about services that authenticate using SIP, like self-checks and overdrive, um, how those services treat the block can vary by library. SIP block behavior is a separate set of settings and those settings exist at the branch level, which means that libraries can decide individually how their SIP services treat the block. At this time, most libraries do not have SIP services block for free text blocks. I think during the COVID lockdown, many libraries eased their SIP block settings to give patrons wider access to e-content. Um, and then what we don't know at this point is like internally, have you decided to keep fewer restrictions in place permanently? Or, you know, maybe your library just has not revisited re-implementing settings at this time. So what we want to do, um, we are pulling together a report that details your library block settings, including the free text block SIP settings. So you can review and decide if you need changes to your settings or not. Um, I am not sure yet if this will be a web report or if this will be a one-off report shared with the library CERC contact. When ready, I will either notify that it's available in web reports or I will share with the CERT contact at your library, along with some tips on how to read the report. Um, so just wanted to uh, quickly emphasize, uh, go over how LEAP and SIP authenticating services reference free text blocks and let you know that we've got this um, nifty little report coming um, so you can review your settings and um, update any changes if you update to make any changes you want. Um, so any questions about those? I'll turn it back to you, Belinda. Okay, thanks, Miyako. Um, next up is door-to-door -door library cards with our friend with no air conditioning, Alicia. <laughs> okay, um, well, I was just wondering, has anybody ever done anything like that, even if it's not for library cards, any sort of door-to-door -door service and what your experience was, how patrons responded, how staff responded, if it was successful or not? Um, so far, I haven't had much luck with like rail surveys. It seems like maybe nobody's really done this sort of thing. Yeah, that's kind of my uh, concern too. I was a little worried about staff safety. On a personal level, I hate it when people come to my front door. <laughs> so even if it was the library, I automatically would have a negative, you know, like in my head, what does this person want kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's other people like me. So I, it's not a, it's not something I want to do. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of one of those too. So <laughs> we do, we do library. It, it does. We do library card signups at at almost all of our outreach programs. So um, you know that is something that we do. We don't get a lot of nibbles. So you know maybe your way would be um, more effective in that way. But yeah, I I wouldn't answer the door. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Could are you just is the goal to get more library cards in patrons' hands per household? Is there a way you could have a map created of which households don't have library cards and then send a interest postcard to them instead of going door to door? I'm not sure, but I like that idea. Yeah, because I know part of the goal is to boost library card signups and I think just boost awareness of the library in general. Well, Alicia, I would just say that um, I kind of agree in terms of staff safety, especially these days where things have changed quite a bit since when I was a kid. Um, I think in terms of safety, I, I wouldn't uh, 
I personally probably wouldn't go that route. I know here at Wilmette, um, I chair a, a lot of the outreach events. And I think that's probably the best way to get people interested in the libraries to, you know, be there at, you know, school events or different markets in the community. Um, just make yourself visible in the community at, at different outreach events. That, that would be my suggestion. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, I'm not a fan of the idea either. So <laughs> that's why I'm kind of looking for feedback. Um, there are a couple comments that have come in. Um, so Carrie from Fox River Valley says, uh, not the same, but we've mailed out blank cards to new apartment complexes, our district, um, in, in our district, uh, and the return was not the best. Um, Tori from Lake Forest says, uh, we don't, uh, not popular limits on door to door. Um, marketing to specific groups, sign up temp cards online is popular. Um, and then, oh, welcome to Lake Forest Baskets. Uh, it sounds like includes library information. Um, oh, yeah. And Rosalie says that Unique has a new mover program and they're looking into starting it. Oh, okay. I'll have to look into that. I haven't heard of that. The other thing that happens too in some communities, they work with the chamber of new people who register. And if you have a good relationship, you might be able to get their addresses and just kind of send a welcome letter to them too. Okay. All right, well, I appreciate um, all of your responses. I will relay that to upper management and see what happens, but thank you very much. Um, oh, and real quick, Park Ridge has been use using the unique new mover program as well. Nice, okay. Could I just ask really quickly, what is the new mover program? It's basically a list of new residents in your community and then our okay. marketing team sends a postcard to them, oh, okay. them to come in and visit the library and they get a little prize when they come in. Oh, they, that's nice. Yeah. So similar, similar to, you know, see who doesn't have a card in your neighborhood or in, in right. your town. Yeah. All right, good. We also put an ad in our net last newsletter and we got quite a few Okay. Um, online signups for that too. Hmm. Thanks for filling in the gaps for me. Well, thank awesome. you everybody. Um, you're very welcome. Great question and lots of good ideas for all of us, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, Kim, are you ready? Library card sign up month. Yay, it's coming up in September. Woohoo. Um, I like the new mover uh, with Unique, that was interesting. So that's kind of a good way to find new people. Just wondered if anyone has anything planned or if you do anything, any excitement around it? Blaine says, if you're talking about September Library Card Sign Up Month, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we started this last year. Um, my department goes around and um, goes to different businesses throughout town and we have partnered last year we partnered with 14 businesses and we did a show your library card um, initiative during the month of September and the feedback I got from the businesses like um, over half of them responded in some way or another and told me that they had gotten new customers and they were thrilled um, it is a fairly um, labor intensive, like I have every member of my staff reach out to three businesses. Um, I contact this year, I'm contacting all the old ones. And, um, but I feel like it's totally worth it. Um, patrons are super excited. And then the other thing I do is that um, all new card holders in the month of September get uh, um, put in a drawing and Current card holders, you don't want to leave them out. We also have like, um, we have, they are allowed to, if their card is in good standing, they're allowed to um, also join the raffle. And the businesses that are participating, I buy like a $10 gift card from as many of them as I can. Um, and that way the business gets additional business because, oh, somebody comes in with 10 bucks and probably will spend more than that. Um, and patrons are thrilled because they got a free thing. Um, 
so it's been super successful, but I will say like, I, you know, we've started working on this in June, um, to work up to, you know, being ready and having all the marketing in and all that kind of stuff. But, um, I do feel like it's been completely worth it. Thank you. I know at Algonquin, we've done a couple of those things in the past. Um, it never ceases to amaze me how incredibly competitive our um, patrons are to, to get those type of things. 14 is an awful lot. That is an amazing task. Um, we had fewer, but we've done it many times and they are always out for the next adventure. And I, and I can't remember, is it library lovers in McHenry County that we did in February? We had so many people come in for that too. You know, anything we can do to, to pull people in, Kim is, is always fun, but yeah, good luck. Thanks. Anything else anybody would like to talk about? Okay, I'm just gonna reiterate the very last um, note on the agenda is about RSVPing for the next meeting. So keep an eye out for all that information to come um, in, in newsletters. I mean, we're gonna be reading it very diligently because there's a lot of stuff going on in the next few months. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, if there's nothing else, if I could get a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn, Anne from Prospect Heights. Thanks, Anne. I'll second Karen from Thanks. Fremont. Thanks, Karen. Happy summer reading, everybody. Yep. See you in the fall. Bye, everybody. Aww. Aww. <laughs> Bye.